So we're going to do a couple of things. One of the things I'm going to do is a little bit of a wrap up because all this stuff comes together under the framework. And we rely on the work that's been done under Get Data Governance, Provenance and Pedigree, tagging and labeling. I was supposed to do two separate presentations and realized they were so intertwined, just couldn't do it. So I just put them together. So it's going to be one presentation. But basically, the scenario is, is we have a fundamental problem. We have to balance the sharing of information, which everybody wants to do, with the protection of a subset of that information, which is, has some sensitivity to somebody. And how do we do that? So if we go to the future, we can, and I basically said I'd start with the government of Canada and their, and their vision for the future. And so much of this is about providing data information and I go information. Data is just the facts and bits and pieces of that. Information informs a decision. It's data in context. Okay, and often when I do my presentation, I have a big brick document, I drop it down and say, is that data or information? Well, if I give you a month to read it, it may be information. If I say you need a decision in the next three minutes, it's data, okay? So basically, this was the starting point and say we want ecosystems and everything else, and we'll try and get to some part of solution. I found this um, quote from James Clapper, director of national tennis in the US, and he talks about the paradox, which is just what I mentioned. How do I balance the sharing, the safeguarding? And I, I personally add to that, that the rules that makes, that I have to share and safeguard Chase, change by operational requirement. What I'm protecting today, based on the situation, I may have to share. So I can't run one plan and survive, we used to call it first contact with the enemy, but it's first contact with reality. I can't sit and do designs that I'm sure will work going forward. When he said the paradox around intelligence it applies in so many areas. He, his role was intelligence, so that's what he was talking about. But I can walk through every of those days, days and I still have that balance. If I talk about healthcare, which seems to be a theme that's going around, all my healthcare information is sitting here in Ontario. I'm down in Washington for a meeting, I'm in a traffic accident. I want them to have certain parts of my data. And I want them to have it now. Allergic to penicillin, forgot, lost my bracelet a long time ago. I want them to know that. Okay, so that information has it. But I don't want them, if there's any health, uh, financial information tied to my health care record, I don't want them to have that. Okay. So basically, the foundation of this, we started about the information data governance, the metadata that we have to carry with this information the tagging and labels, provenance and pedigree. I'm going, it's not a real technology problem. It's an information management problem. We have to understand our data and we have to understand the information that people need to make the decision. And I'm saying that we're not very good at that, of understanding what that is. I gotta be able to both share that information and safeguard that information. And I can't separate those two concepts. They have a national information sharing and safeguarding strategy, and I can tell you what date. It was a Wednesday in March at three o'clock in the afternoon at a presentation where I said you can't separate the exchange of information from the protection of that information. And that rattled on, and a year, in 2012, a year later, they had a strategy because somebody says, yeah, that's a real good point. Okay, and I got that through working with uh, NATO and coalitions, where I have 29 partners, well, it's actually almost 60 partners now, if you bring in partners for peace, of different levels of trust and I have to share that information. I go, there's no difference than that in the healthcare system with everybody that has to share, or government, which, which program did we deliver that does not include another government agency, another level of government, private sector, or a citizen. 
So we have the same problem. I go, why do we want to share information? Seems silly that I'd want to wrap up with something like this, but it informs decisions. That's number one. Everybody makes decisions. And it's not the senior exec. It's the decision maker right down at the last mile of discussions. It enables us to collaborate. Things are a little bit better now, not necessarily perfect, but during the ice storm, I drove up or tried to get to my street, and there were 15 power company trucks lined up on the street, and all the drivers and the crews were sitting there chatting on what to do, and there's miles of broken poles. They were self-organizing on the spot. There was no command and control. It improves operational posture. The more I know, the faster I have the information, the faster I can make my decisions and move those resources. And it's a natural resource multiplier. Those 15 trucks probably could have been deployed a whole lot better had they uh, been better uh, organized. Okay? And then it's a, the foundation and the enabler of a whole host of things. If you're not interested in uh, command and control, it's incident management, same difference. When I get into information systems, and I, having worked with the government for the last 30 years, uh, <laughs> I can't think of a government system right now that doesn't have some twidbit of some private or sensitive information floating around it somewhere. It doesn't have to be classified. And I have a lot of people telling me about classified information. Well, private information isn't classified. It has really little national interest. It affects an individual. I like the US term, I really do. Unclassified, or sensitive but unclassified, because it's two separations of concern. Data ownership. Does the government own my data, or do I own my data? Who makes the choice of what information is shared on my behalf? And I, you can have a whole lot of good debate about that. I suggest the government is a steward or a custodian of my data, not the owner of my data. And we should look at it. They have a fiduciary responsibility to protect that information. And it has a whole bunch of potential social impact thing that I go, we're really trying to get to somewhere where we're at responsible information sharing, which is the maximization of the availability of information while protecting those sensitive bits. I can start with private data, confidential data, kind of use it in the commercial sense, proprietary data, IP, Legally significant information, the things I have, and we get into provenance and pedigree and all that information, that comes together really clearly till I get to the classified data, which is the stuff of national interest that can affect the country. And this is my overview of IMIT on a slide, what we're trying to do. We're trying to take in every source of data we possibly can, stuff it into this big pool of stuff, I got data lake in here, where I think the DFO was the data enterprise, <laughs> okay? And basically say, at that point, I want to curate that data. I want to pull out that information that will support whatever type of an analysis I want to do on that data, analytics. Once I get to that, I'm looking for three things. Intelligence, foresight. What's going to ha what potentially could happen in the future? Situational awareness, what is happening, what did happen? And then support, hard to read, collaborative planning. If I go back and say, which program do I run that doesn't involve somebody else, I've got to collaborate in planning. Once I've solved that small problem, then I have an answer and I have to determine what is the sensitivity of that answer. What part of that answer that I have can I share with partners at different levels of trust, different levels of authority, different rights to see that information, different needs for that information. 
Again, remember my big document. If I send them all the stuff, and it's going out to, when we talk about policing, out to the nth little node out on the network, and they get all this information, and they print it out, and have to read it but make a decision, it's not overly useless. So I have to make all those decisions before I go forward. The IEF was specifically focused on that problem environment. I said I'd talk a little bit about metadata. Metadata goes everywhere. The provenance and the pedigree data, all that information gets tagged on there somewhere. In some areas, we want it within the payloads of the message. Sometimes we want it in the header of the message so people can see what the data is. Because I often encrypt my payload, provide some header information so people know what, what they can do with it, and then pass it along. But there's meta tags and labels. So I have my operational data. I have all this metadata. Some of the metadata I have to create on the fly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But as I go through and I tag and label and I get through this, when I throw my stuff in my lake, we say, OK, we have our um, registry of information out there. Well, that's all metadata. How do I go find that stuff? What's my discovery? Who owns it? What rights do people have to use it? That's all metadata that's often added as we go forward. We, we transition it to a common form. Now I got two versions of this stuff, the original input data and what it became. We've got provenance and pedigree data. How do I make the connections between them? We want to stage it for the analytics, because analytics has a specific data set and a specific type of information it wants to see. We have to stave it for that. And then marshal it to the dashboards or the reports or whatever else I'm dealing with. On the other side, again, key to us is the quality of the data and the information that we're handing out. There's a lot of aspects. Timely accurate, so we're into the real-time processing of this data in some cases. I focus a lot on actionable. Can I use that data? Could the end user use that data once they receive it? Again, it's an information management problem. What do they need? Is it relevant to the situation? President was coming, it was actually President Bush, and I was talking to an RCMP officer, and he said, you know my problem is, if you could just get rid of all that text messaging and just put it to a side for a while and just give me those things that are absolutely relevant to what I need to do because I got to protect the president, that would be super. I want to get rid of the data because most of it was not relevant. That he had to bring a quart of milk home at the end of the evening really didn't matter to him at the moment. So that was a big piece of what was going on. Oops. Metadata types, there's all kinds of types. And when we got into the provenance and pedigree discussion, it just kept expanding. The list of things that might be addressed by this data governance group just kept growing. So I have descriptive things, who's the owner, author, and abstract. Structural, what's the schema? What's the structure of that information? Need to know that if I've got to go process it. Administrative types of data that goes forward. Security data often has to get added to it. Got to be able to discover this stuff. And any of us who've worked with GC docs or RDMs and tried to find anything, it's all about the metadata and handling instructions. One of the things I started bringing up at this uh, provenance and pedigree and governance discussion is what is a common way of saying no forward that information? You can receive it, you can use it, but you can't send it to anybody. How do I track that through this or anything? You have to encrypt that data using a specific cryptology. How do I put that information on there? We're giving the mechanisms, not all the, uh, the house. These are some of the things that tags and labels actually provide for you. They allow you to uh, put everything in context, discover and access it, safeguard it, manage it, understand what's going on with it. And basically, we have a working group to do that. So that's the metadata. We use that metadata for just about everything. 
the information exchange framework was trying to do three, three things. Integrate the sharing and the safeguarding, the exchange and the protection. And as we were going through that and we started looking at structured information, things that we built on the fly. If I wrote an email, if I looked at writing a file, doing a Word document or a spreadsheet, I've got an operator engaged. The operator can give me some tags and labels of what that is, tools to do that. When I started looking at structured information, I build messages, I build documents, I build things on the fly. It's machines and software that operate on it. How do I put the tags and labels? Who does it? Operators can't do it. Too many messages at one time. How do I write the rules and apply the rules to that information? Okay? And basically, that was the core of it. When we started about talking about safeguarding, encryption, yeah, okay, encryption at rest, encryption in flight. What do I do as I aggregate the data is my challenge, okay? I want to be able to redact the content. I got two partners, one I trust, one I don't. I got to share something with them so they can operate. What can I share out of that data set? Can I pull those elements out of the data set to share it? Electronic health record. What can I share with the health insurance company versus what can I share with your primary care physician, with your specialist? There's all kinds of ways, banking information. What can I share with different institutions at different times? Then basically what we want to say we want to mark that information. Got tired of saying tagging and labeling, so we use mark. And then if something's going wrong, how do I send the alerts and warnings to people when, that can do something about fixing the, the challenge? Canadian invention. This started at DRDC, Defense Research some number of years ago and basically they were working on unstructured data how do I work on tags and labels the project was called Samson we were starting on structured data we were working on the multilateral interoperability program and basically started looking at how do we package data assemble it which was the aggregation transform mark and redact structure it and format I can have a message that somebody in XML, another person wants it in JSON. Same data set. How do I manage that? Okay. When I process it, how do I parse it consistently, write it down into the database, map the transactions, do any transformations that I have to, and then marshal the data to my data store? We added a complexity. Sometimes I don't have a data store. I want it on my phone. If I lose my phone, the power goes out, all the data is lost, so it's not compromised. So basically, the concepts that we were expressing that's in the, the uh, IEF came out of a whole lot of experimentation. I don't have the list of trials and tribulations of Samson through the various experimentation that they were doing, but we've started out of the multilateral interoperability. The last one was TIE's Trustus Information Exchange Services, which was does for shared services, public safety, transport, and CBSA. So our objectives were policy-driven data-centric. We wanted to set, extract the rules from the services that executed them. Easiest way, think of a relational database. You develop your entity relationship diagram, generate the DDL, stick it into Oracle, now I have an application. When we were looking at this back in the day, we looked in, how do you do that for interfaces? What exists? So we found that we have to write a vocabulary, a language, a modeling technique to allow that to happen so I can control it. There was a number of reasons for that, which I'll get into in a minute. We wanted defense in depth to the data layer. Everybody was focused on networks and platforms and applications. 
But what we really need to do is protect the data or the information, whichever you'd prefer. If I'm protecting an elephant and I'm protecting a diamond ring, security is completely different. If I put the elephant in the safe with the diamond ring, it starves to death or suffocates. What content I have will determine what security aspects I need. How much encryption? Does it have to be encrypted? Can I share it in the clear? Responsible information sharing is the balance, uh, maximizing the availability and protecting the bits. The old favorite, right information, right person, right time, so we can go back to Trace's presentation. Day zero capability. I have an emergency stand up. What can I deploy on day zero when it first happens that gives me some capability to communicate with my partners? If I have the rules, technology is deployed, <coughs> Rules are separate. I can build a library of rules for different types of situations, deploy the closest fit that I have, and oh, by the way, it's all metadata, it's all data driven. I can manipulate and administer the policies in the operational environment. Of course, security on who can do that type of thing. So now I can take one of these. Oh, and at the end of the day, we said, okay, hit the button, save it put it into my library for the next time and I have a new capability. So we wanted to separate the concerns. Based on open standards, we're writing the open standards. The reference architecture, you can download, it's free, enjoy yourselves. It's a beta one, it's in final edits. But there's not a lot of change to it uh, between now and there. Benefits. Just started talking about agility and flexibility that we don't have in most of our systems right now. Military used to talk about systems and capabilities and plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. I keep going, it doesn't survive first contact with reality. Reduce cost. I can deploy infrastructure. It can host a whole host of missions, not the mission specific systems that we tend to build right now. Reduce risk. It's flexible, it's agile, I can change it if I didn't get it right the first time. More so than that, I can deploy policies iteratively. I can start with a small capability, build it out. The way it's structured in this, I can put it in a desktop exercise. Run desktop exercises and tweak the policies in the desktop and store them and use them in the next mission that comes close to it. Retain institutional memory. And I talk about this quite a bit with a lot of folks. I've got all the models. It's all model driven. It's all in my architecture. It's tied to my missions, my operations, my systems, all the way down the pipe. I can go back and get those models. Interface to, interfaces today are mainly code. Programmer comes in and says, I don't like that and starts rewriting the whole interface. You gain and lose, plus I have to go through a massive testing cycle to make sure I haven't broken anything along the way. So it's months till I get a new capability out the door. This is all data and business driven. In total, these are the components of the IEFRA. You basically have enforcement points and we have a packaging service which has also a policy enforcement point. So not only are we checking and run executing policy against the builds of the information and the receipt of the information, but we're also using that stack of more standard metadata driven policy point. So we, if you think of an exact null policy point, if people were up on that, that's also there. So it's a two stage uh, scenario. The ISS, uh, the uh, packaging and processing service is the one that enforces the packaging and processing requirements. There's a logging service, a policy decision point, which is, could be exact or whatever you want to use in there. Administrative point, which allows me to control my policies at runtime. That became a key feature in this discussion. And then we defined a messaging bus which provides secure communications between these services. So we separate it from the standard communications in the environment. All the purple areas in here is your own infrastructure. 
We do not want to get into a scenario of rip and replace. Nobody can afford it. Can we put this in and integrate it in with the current services we have? So we add in a security gateway, which provides you an integration point for your integrators to put this information into the environment. Then we were asked to add all the rest of the services for communications that I tend to use, which is the email, the file share, the chat, whatever that we were having. So the infrastructure defines all the interfaces for communications between these, these elements. So structured data, semi-structured data, just some definitions. But basically, we were trying to handle. We do not look at any specific data structure or any messaging structure in particular. That's up to you to choose. It's your operational environment. Okay? We're just giving you a way to control that information as you move it through the system. When we first started promoting this concept at OMG, oh, you're trying to address world hunger. We said, no, just like a database, you can do an, ER, an ERD and generate the data structure. Same basic concept. I can define any kind of data, that, data structure in that ERD and produce it in an Oracle environment or a SQL Server environment or anything I wanted to do. Challenges, host of challenges, I'm not gonna read them. But most people can recognize something in there that's affecting them on a daily basis. The one that I do point to is the modest amount of sensitive information baked into our systems. It's not all the data. Though our systems right now says, oh, it's high side, you can't move the data down. 90% of the data came from the low side of the equation. It was moved up and can't get moved anymore. So if we start talking about complete digitization, that would have to be defined. When it, what was it? It was National Defense, they were saying, on the secret, they have 142 secret networks because they also divided by the caveats on the qualifications which nations could participate. They said, even in the secret domain, we have to collapse that down to one network so we can communicate. If we want the digitization of the government, and I believe people when they say they do, that has to be addressed. To a solution, I gotta separate the concerns, and I'll touch on this one in another slide. But there's IT concerns, which is the deployment of infrastructure. There's IM concerns of who's getting what, where, when, and how, and doing auditing on that. And there's business concerns as what am I sharing and making sure that my partners have the right information. And I meet my fiduciary responsibilities to share that information, to protect that information. We want to augment and not replace. So that's a repeat of before. Flexible agility. The approaches we took, it's model driven. So I'm managing my environment. I'm using the architecture uh, techniques that we were, we've been talking about for a day and a half now. Rules-based, that's just the separation of the technology from the rules that we're running to apply. We want to run those, be able to ingest those rules at runtime for the specific mission, and then administer at runtime. Enhanced logging, that's for real-time monitoring tell me what's going wrong in my system, or if anything's going wrong in my system, or somebody's trying to do something they're not supposed to, or a service is trying to do something it's not supposed to, and forensic auditing, can I make this better? Can I tweak these rules and make it better? It's iterative. Integration of open standards. In the separation of concerns, this is the way we, I use to is I have the technology, I can deploy my infrastructure out to the field. My source of all requirements is legislation, regulation, operating procedures, information sharing agreements. We model them down as an IEPPV, which is a modeling technique, it's a UML extension, standardized version one at OMG. We analyze and test. We can test this in desktop exercise, get our partners into the room, test the environments, and then I can deploy those. Well, I take one more step that's not in here. I can create a library of these scenarios 
and move them forward. So basically, when we go through, since you were all here, you got inundated with modeling yesterday. <laughs> you know what all these things mean. <laughs> the U Unified Architecture Framework, which is the foundation I took on this, is basically, it was to support DODAF and MODAF, Department of Defense Architecture Framework, and the Ministry of Defense Architecture Framework, which is now gone. They've rolled into NAF, which is the NATO architecture framework, and there were dozens more. I used to go TLAAF, the three-letter acronym architecture framework. Okay? We still have DINDAF, which is loosely tied to this. They were focusing on UML integration. Well, individually, yes, they could define some of this stuff, but they didn't support this approach that we were looking at. So basically, we developed a new profile for UML. It's extensible. So we defined a profile. A few new stereotypes, I think it was a half dozen stereotypes, that we put on UML that basically says how we build these things. We're at a stage right now that I can use UML, ingest the database, now I know what my storage structure looks like, and start building those models. And actually, use model-driven architecture techniques, transforms, and generate the models, ingest them into a service, and off I go. For those who are asking about Neem and where it fits into this, is now I can get the message structures, whether it's JSON or XML for Neem, tie that into the environment. Now I got the top and bottom of my stack. There's a whole bunch of transforms that I can do now the analysts can get between them and match them up. Now I have all the rules exposed to me as how I support that NEAM message, that IEPD, Information Exchange Data Path, with the database I have. Recommendation that we've made to the NEAM is that model, IEPPV, to a standard NEAM database structure should be part of the IEPD. For those who don't have systems like that last mile unit, they can develop and have a database for storage as well. Piece is not in there, and I have all the infrastructure. If I took the top part of the IPPV model, I could then map it down to my own environment through the same approach. I could import my environment and then do the mapping. Now I have something executable. We started saying that we have a whole lot of business decisions. The one I'll pick on is tagging and labeling. What tags and labels do I have to put on the data to support operations that's not in my data? Security tags is a good one. I have a definition for a, a unit or an organization. It has a name profile. That's good. If I'm talking about an administrative unit sitting somewhere in the Ottawa area, what's in the phone book? Not overly classified, I could describe it. You could figure out quite easily out of open data, their capabilities, what they do. If I make that special forces, same definition of an organization, it's highly classified. It is not the structure of the data that affects that, it's the content of the data at runtime that affects that. So we have a whole bunch of those rules and the combinations. What makes a piece of data private? Well, that's a whole bunch of rules. So we said, hey, there's a decision modeling notation out there, standard. It's tied in with everything else. It's part of my environments now. Well, can I use that and add descriptors into an architecture that will allow me to capture all those rules and write in a standard way. And we're working on that piece right now and we'll see if there's any extensions to DMN we need. Then we said, okay, well now I have this whole repository of system descriptions, enterprise descriptions, operational descriptions. Can I start supporting my business lines? my operations, what I have to do and start using that data as part of my analytics. Okay? So in these forums where we get together, we say, well, what would we do? If you were here yesterday, 
KDM Analytics was talking about threat risk. It's against information in the UF. Could it be extended into the information today? I'd suggest yes, okay, having seen the demos, and say, what are the threats and risks to my data, not only my networks and my systems, and take it from there. We can do a whole lot more on automation and setting up the environment, increasing the capacity for day zero capability, iterative approaches for moving things forward. These are things that we can do. We have a whole roadmap that's out there on a board of things that we're looking at doing to extend this environment and increase the flexibility. Is it limited to our original military approach? It can be applied to anything. There's nothing tying it together. As there's nothing tying UAF to anything specifically military. Most important, having worked in numerous of the departments over the last 30 years. Um, every time I go to update, revise a system, finding information on that system so I can do it effectively and transform that system to what I want it to be is darn near impossible to do. It takes forever until you throw your hands up in the air and start working on it. It's not unique to anybody in the Canadian government, it happens in industry too, I've worked there as well. Back in 1980 when I started this, there was an Air Force study that said a, a systems engineer spends 80% of their time searching for data, 20% of their time engineering. I don't think anything's changed. After 38 years, I don't think anything's changed. But that's key and critical to this. When you're going into an operation or a mission or trying to build something new, what is there without starting something completely different? Where do I go find it quickly? We may find we have nothing. Okay, we build something new. But if there's something that exists, let's build on it so we can integrate it and get to that digital strategy. So basically that's it in its totality. I just want to go back to one thing. This is the process of building a message. We have data at the bottom. It may be in one or more data stores, one or more data structures. So we define the foundation level in the IEF. Just connect me to my data. Puts and gets, reads and writes. Then I have a transactional layer. Why transactional layer? Anybody know what a database transaction is? <laughs> we thought we could stay consistent with the community, and uh, we really actually called it a transactional. Then the ontologist got on us, so you can't call it a noun. So we said, okay, we have a transactional element. As I aggregate pieces of data, Traditional security says I can add tags and labels and security and sensitivity tags on the rows of data, even to the attribute. Adding huge amounts of overhead, but I, it's doable. When I aggregate those two elements of data, what's the new sensitivity? Is it the same sensitivity at the, as the individual pieces, or is it increased? How do I write a set of rules as I'm building it in there? Don't tell me I can code it. Yes, I can, but totally inflexible. And write those rules into that environment. Where do I put those tags and labels as I'm building? Do I put them in the header or just in the body? Okay. And at that point, I want to aggregate the data. I want to tag and label the data. I want to make those decisions. And we said, okay, we, maybe we can use DMN for that versus writing code on how I do that for each element. I want to mark it, add the tags, and then redact it. Redact means filter it out. I've got three partners at three levels of trust. What are each of them allowed to see? I can take that away. Forget the security side and trust. What do they need to see to make their decision? Because I may stay at the start of my mission, though it's filtered out, they're not allowed to see it. The severity of the mission and the role they're playing in the mission says, I don't care what policy said. I'm going to get rid of that filter. I'm going to send them that data. I'm going to take the risk of sending them that data because I've got operational authority in this position. 
I used to tell, go, never told the captain on a ship, no, sir, you can't do that. <laughs> okay? At which point I have a data set that I can release once they followed all those rules. Remember I said, at that point, I've got a semantic layer. It meets the semantics of the exchange. I haven't formatted it yet. I can format it any which way to support my agreement with that partner. Okay, so we separated out the rules and I point to its schema or its rules or its publishing software, whatever it is to allow that to happen. That's at the information exchange specification level. That's my sharing agreement. That tells me how it's formatted, which services I share it on, and how I wrote it to those services. Okay, so basically I can share with number of partners and there's one more catch on this thing. Database triggers. We all know what database triggers are. Something happens in the database, the database changes, and all of a sudden we have to do something. Well, we didn't want to use trigger, so we called it a watch point. We're watching that data element. If it changes, it identifies all the things it's part of and produces all the messages for all the partners that need part or all of that data. Okay, so if I trigger this element over here, it will go see if all the, all the messages that have to go out, it's part of all three messages. It will create it, format it, and send them out. In the old days, we called it event-driven global update. Okay, when we're talking about a, a tornado that hit the West End and we got to keep everybody updated, I don't want to go keep sending messages and emails out to everybody. I want the system to know how to deploy that information rapidly. This is the eye chart. There's an exam at 12. But all this is telling you is the models themselves are fairly simple, not overly difficult to read and deal with. Up there is just operational nodes. There's my sharing agreement. It combines how I share the information with the information I share on how I share that information. So it tracks the association between them is equivalent to the uh, sharing agreement. We create the filters on the semantics. And all the way down at the bottom over here, Here's our foundation element, and that's the database table it's writing it to. Fully traceable. Often things I need to see when I'm analyzing code, and I don't typically have. So basically, it's, this is all showing you that there's traceability all the way. Because I've tied that, you'll see there in the DODAF and NAF, it's an OV2. It's a participant diagram. I trace to that. That traces me to all the systems and applications and interface where it's running. I can trace it through my whole environment. Now I can analyze what's happening with it. What we basically said overall, user data, transactional processing, which basically builds the data sets, information exchange controller. Then I basically said I put it out to a policy enforcement point, which revalidates the tags and labels, and I got it right, and it's ready to go. And then I can put it out over any infrastructure I want. I can route it out to the infrastructure. And all the models on how that's done is stored in my enterprise architecture or my system architecture. We extended it and said, oh, we can get more flip. We can have translations and build all this at runtime. They're all libraries. So I have a standard thing I can flow out there and I can push these libraries out at needed at runtime. And I'm not doing software updates everywhere. So those are the underlying concepts of it. This is the more detailed linking all the pieces together. My design environment, serialized, sent to the administration point, which points it out to each of the services in my network. And yes, the administration point can be hosted centrally or deployed on every node. It's your operational environment. You can do it either way you want. The PEP links me into my network. 
and all the security services and things that I need is through the gateway. And basically the administrator could have multiple sets. I could have policies per phase of the mission. And the administrator could put it out. If you were so inclined, you can automate that process. We're not telling anybody how to do it. We're giving the pieces. Oops. Okay. So the summary, it's a framework for doing things. It's not telling you how to design your environment. It's policy-driven data-centric. It's policies against the data, not the applications and networks and everything else. It's what I do with my data. There's an evolving set of uh, standards. The reference architecture is a beta one specification here at OMG. It's in final edits, but it's still available on the website. The PPV is version one. It's been around for a while. PPS initial submission, which is the packaging and processing service, initial submission is November. So the RFP is out there to do that. It's based on a Canadian innovation, which I can say up here in Canada. It evolved. Tom can take credit for some of it. <laughs> Poe's not here. So basically the uh, scenario is there. There's more information. There's two uh, white papers. I think there's, um, they're on the OMG site right now. So you might want to share those out. And the standards where you can go pick them up. <laughs> 